mai ka la hiki a ka la kau, mai ka hoku i a ka hala vai. Um, mai ka hi kapa i ke kahi kapa aku o keia honua nei. Uh, Kevelina a ke aloha i a ka koa pau, mahalo nui no ka hele ana mai i keia ka kahiaka e lohe i keia. Ho ike ike ho ana au au. Uh, e pili ana i ka hana nui a maua Wade. Uh, ma ke kula kai ulu o eva me wai ana i ma o ahua lua. Um, no ka loli ana o keia kula i mea pa ai ke kuana ike Hawaii. Um, aloha mai kako. My name is Anne-Marie Paikai. Mahalo nui to everyone for coming this morning to hear about um, how we are working towards building a Native Hawaiian place of learning through indigenization, OER, and specifically through our lens at the library. Uh, as I said, my name is Anne-Marie Paikai. So I am a Kanaka Oivi or Native Hawaiian librarian at Leeward Community College. Um, I was born and raised in California, so away from my homeland, or my ancestral homeland. Um, and I found my way back to seek my degree in Hawaiian studies at the University of Hawaii at Hilo, um, I, where I got my Hawaiian studies and Hawaiian language degree there. And then I moved over to the University of Hawaii at Manoa, which is on Oahu, uh, to get my library and information science degree. Um, Along the way, I've trained as a hula practitioner, which has really informed a lot of my understanding and, and a relationship to Hawaiian knowledge, although I'm very out of practice, so please don't ask me to dance. Um, <laughs> and um, I'm also a mother and very persistent in uh, how my husband and I raise our family and ensuring that we are returning our keiki, our children, back to um, language learning in their schools and in their experiences and uh, relationship with our lahui aloha or our communities. Aloha. Uh, my name is Wade Oshiro. I'm a fourth generation settler descendant um, from people from Okinawa. Um, I was born and raised in Hawaii. Um, culturally, I was... Uh, brought up in a mixture of uh, American as well as Asian Japanese culture. Um, I have degrees in history and library science from the University of Hawaii at Manoa. Um, and I'm also um, the first generation in my family to be a college graduate. Um, so we just want to start off our talk uh, with this quote that comes from a recently published article by Siobhan Matsuda and Kavena Komeji, who are two uh, staunch Aloha Aina librarians or um, uh, Lahui warriors, our activists, our advocates in libraries who are Native Hawaiian from uh, Hana Maui and Nu'uanu O'ahu. Uh, they are also our colleagues at the University of Hawaii System uh, at University of Maui College and University of uh, West O'ahu, respectively. They are also very close friends and colleagues of mine and have really shaped my understanding of how what the intersection between librarianship, specifically Hawaiian librarianship, um, can look like to support our communities in Hawaii. Um, and this was published in Uproot, which is a publishing collective that exists to center the works of, and knowledge and experiences of BIPOC within the context of the library and the archives community. So the quote is from uh, this um, publication. As the saying goes, ignorance is bliss, and indeed the ignorance of colonization and continued occupation of Hawaii has been a privilege to settlers. Um, and, you know, th these authors spoke specifically in the context of libraries, and we know that libraries can reinforce oppression um, as well as colonization. And so um, I think for me, this uh, re reading this was very impactful as a settler. Uh, I understand, I'm beginning to understand more uh, how, as a settler, I'm complicit in some of the oppression and um, colonization that continues to this day. And so what we'll be doing today is sharing uh, kind of our journey within the library, especially as uh, how we're gonna approach uh, quote unquote indigenization of our college. Yeah. Um, so we're gonna just share a, a bit about our context uh, very briefly. Um, so Leeward Community College is one of seven community college campuses in the state of Hawaii. We're part of the University of Hawaii system of colleges and universities. Um, we are the only, UH is the only public system of higher education in Hawaii. Our main campus is um, 
at Pu'aloa, and it's located in the Ahupua'a of Waiava. Um, today, this area is known as Pearl City, and our campus is just offshore of uh, Pearl Harbor. It's in the center there. On the far west side, uh, we have our um, Wainaimoku campus, which is uh, located in the Ahupua'a of Lualole. Um, and that specific west side of the island is where um, a high percentage of uh, Hawaii, native Hawaiians live to this day. And so Leeward, um, we are the largest of the uh, community college campuses in terms of enrollment. Uh, we serve a large geographic area of the island of Oahu, um, and we also serve, again, a large population of native Hawaiians. So uh, this is, these are just some numbers uh, about our, our institution. 25% um, of our students identify as Native Hawaiians. Um, and as many community, co community college has, colleges excuse me, have experienced over the past few years, enrollment has declined. Um, but enrollment for our Native Hawaiian students has dropped by double digits. Um, and so, um, yeah. And, I'm not sure if anyone really understands yet why um, that's happening. So out of our um, 126 or so in full-time instructional faculty, 8.7% of faculty identify as Native Hawaiians. So they are very much underrepresented amongst our instructional faculty. Um, I wasn't able to get um, data for, about our total employees at Leeward, but uh, I, I wouldn't imagine it be that much different. Maybe a, a, a bit higher percentage of Native Hawaiians, but clearly uh, Native Hawaiians are underrepresented within our faculty. So briefly about UHCC OER, it's a system-wide initiative um, covering the seven campuses. Um, and we've run various programs that you probably all run. Um, Let's see. And so since 2015, when we kind of first got started, we estimate student savings of textbooks in excess of $21 million. Currently, 34% of our campuses, um, excuse me, courses are uh, designated TXT0, and TXT0 is our course marker, and it stands for um, textbook cost zero. So it's an affordability course marker. It's not a true true OER course marker. And we, we, we see about 21,000 uh, registrations every semester in these TXT0 courses. So let me talk about OER at Leeward now. Um, Leeward faculty were early adopters of OER in our system, and so that's reflected in some of our numbers. So uh, currently 58% of our instructors teach a TXT0 course. Um, six, excuse me, 67% of our instructors teach a TXT0 course, 58% of our classes are marked TXT0, and cost savings are there, so just around $10 million since 2015. So if we examine our OER efforts um, through the uh, social justice principles um, outlined by Sarah Lambert, uh, Leeward's OER initiative is strongest in that top tier of redistributive justice, um, by through, through our efforts to uh, remove textbook costs for our students. Um, now we're gonna highlight um, some of our projects that recognize the diversity of Hawaii's population that incorporate um, Native Hawaiian values, culture, um, and knowledge, and have Native Hawaiians as either authors or co-creators. Um, so as we heard from this morning's keynote by Kayla Larson, um, there are a lot of different varieties of what Indigenous OER looks like and um, thinking about the difference between um, about Indigenous folks or from or for Indigenous folks. So this is an example of one of our textbooks um, that we um, that is used for our Hawaiian Studies 107 course, which is a huge course in that it uh, is a general education requirement. And so many, many students outside of Hawaiian Studies um, also take this course. Um, 
And the two authors of this reader um, is our Momi Kamahele Kumumomi. She was the uh, first one to start, first faculty member to start our Hawaiian Studies program and really advocated for that to be established at our co community college, as well as Ku'uli ku Bolosh, who is uh, one of our first instructors that we had. The two of them, between them, um, put together this reader, um, and I actually don't have the year, oh, it looks like around 20, 2008, so this is prior to any OER efforts, and it's a, it is a reader, it's a compilation of different readings from various, um, uh, pre previous Hawaiian Studies classes at our four-year universities, and they put it together as a way to move forward the curriculum that happens in Hawaiian Studies 107, which is our basic Hawaiian Studies course covering history, geography, geology, um, po politics, arts, many different things are covered in this course. Um, in 2015, the library approached uh, Kumumomi and uh, Kuuipo to discuss the possibility of um, adopting a TXT0 um, approach to their reader and to sort of revamping what they had. Um, and while they were very um, cordial and like open and talking in talking about it, ultimately the decision was to not actually move in that direction. Um, one of the major reasons is because this actually is a funding stream for the Hawaiian Studies Department and it became sort of an impact or an implication for the Hawaiian Studies Department for us to suddenly move to an OER text or an OER uh, resource because the Hawaiian Studies Department, which is, you know, um, was, took a lot to sort of establish in the first place, was able to get a substantial stream of funding from students across disciplines who were taking this course because of the general education requirements. Um, but then in 2021, uh, we recently applied and were uh, granted, our college was granted a Title III grant entitled He Loa Keaho, Systemic Practices re envisioned for Native Hawaiian Student Success. And the Hawaiian Studies Department, aside from um, major discussion with the library, did write in an OER text and uh, as part of that grant project. And so one of the major lessons that we had sort of learned, and there was never any bad bloods between our Hawaiian Studies Department and our library as, as a result of this discussion, but one of the major takeaways that we found was that faculty really need to be able to have the agency to determine how, when, and why and OER is going to be established into their, into their courses and the way that they operate. And so it was a really powerful um, uh, uh, example for us and a learning experience. Yeah, mahalo. Another example of some texts that we have been working on is called the Botany Hawaii text, which was... Um, established by two instructors in our math and science department. This is uh, an introductory botany text that is specific to the Hawaii context. Now these two instructors, Daniela Dutra, Eli Dutra Elliott and Paula Meija Velasquez, they are uh, settlers and non-indigenous instructors in our math and science department. As far as we know, we have no indigenous folks that are working in math and science right now, which is um, a shame. However, these two instructors in particular are, have been, pri even prior to the development of this text, very intentional about taking their students out onto our land-based and establishing partnerships with our land-based nonprofit organizations who are trying to um, conserve and improve our land um, in various capacities, whether that's at the Lo'i or our tarot fields or at um, uh, some of our forests, our dry forests, um, our wetland forests, and our fish ponds. And so they've been intentional in the way that they build their class prior to this point in incorporating Aina-based or land-based practices. And as in doing so, realized their real need to have some sort of a text that aligned with what they were already teaching in their course. That being said, they started to develop this course on their own, using their own photos, using drawings that they created, and using Native Hawaiian students to sort of help and support and guide along some of the chapters and the way that they worked through this text. And they also consulted with me at the library. I am very new to OER, so this is not necessarily something that's actually in the purview of my job. However, they um, had consulted with me because of my um, work alongside Wade, as well as um, they consulted with our Hawaiian Council, which is a governing body on our campus. And so it was a really interesting and very successful, in my opinion, example of how OER was implemented in a way that really aligned with our practices go by through consultation and, um, and uh, do sort of implementing what they were already doing. Sorry, go ahead, yeah. Um, this last example is a more recent example. Um, it's, it, this is a report that actually was not developed initially as an OER text. It was a report that was in alignment with our strategic planning activities that we've been doing on our campus at Leeward Community College. 
Um, there was a need that grew from our administration to do some research on the Aina or the land that we actually, um, our campuses are on. Um, and so um, myself, as along with a counselor over at the Waianaimoku campus, Christopher Pokipala, and a student alumni who is currently a PhD student who did his dissertation research on the land that our campus sits as a result of his experience being a student at Leeward Community College, we collaborated to create a, a a report. Um, it's still kind of incompletion. We're still tidying it up. But um, along the, the way of doing that, I was approached by Wade and some of our OER folks to sort of turn this into a text and be able to allow this to uh, be implemented as a teaching tool for our faculty and possibly something that they can implement into their courses. And so we're in uh, progress of doing working on that currently. Okay. And so in thinking, re thinking and reflecting on how our institution can become a native Hawaiian place of learning, which we'll talk about in just a sec, uh, we recognize that OER is a tool for facilitating indigenous, indigenous knowledge and values into course curriculum and institutional practices. And so the examples that we've shown how demonstrate, demonstrate OER's potential to uplift traditional knowledge within higher education. And in the future, we're trying to figure out how can we wield this tool of OER in a more intentional way that really helps us to feel as if we are grounding ourselves as a native Hawaiian place of learning. We are working to reform a Western education system, but how can we wield OER, a Western education tool, to help support that effort? So what's driving this change? Uh, are some new strategic, strategic plans, excuse me. At both uh, Leeward CC, um, there is a pillar uh, titled Native Hawaiian Place of Learning. Um, and uh, at the UH system level, uh, the first imperative is to fulfill kuleana, or responsibility to Native Hawaii Hawaiians and Hawaii. And so, um, so yeah, so the library has been on this journey predating the um, strategic plans. Um, and looking at how we can participate in this transformation. Um, and so in that being said, the library really is investigating what does it mean for us to participate in this transformation from a Western-centric model of education to one that's more grounded in indigenous-centered and grounded in that Kanaka Oivi or Native Hawaiian worldview. And so there's a couple of uh, ways that we've started to do that, predating these strategic plans and that we hope to align with the strategic plan work that's being done on a broader level. So we do have a um, EDI committee uh, within the library um, and so we've been uh, doing a lot of uh, actually learning. And so learning about, you know, the library as a profession and how it, it is not uh, neutral, even though oftentimes we say that uh, libraries are neutral. Um, you know, uh, there is this uh, report, uh, and now Pu report, uh, which was um, authored by uh, Native Hawaiian librarians, including Anne Marie, that presented the University of Hawaii libraries uh, with a, and uh, administration, excuse me, the U, entire UH administration as well as libraries. And so for the libraries, they identified 10 uh, recommendations uh, for libraries to implement, to create, cr make libraries more uh, welcoming spaces because in their research, they, they learned that for Native Hawaiian scholars, uh, the, our libraries and our archives were not considered uh, very welcoming uh, to them. So one of the initial projects that us as the EDI committee were able to initiate was a cross-collaborative project uh, to create a mural for our uh, storefront windows at the Library and Learning Commons. And so we were able to provide an opportunity to an art student. Um, well, the whole class was able to participate, but we uh, ultimately chose uh, this piece of work that was done by one of our art students. Um, and this has been a initiative that helps us to improve the aesthetic of our campus, but also uplift the stories of our place. And so this, this um, mural is a uh, depiction of our shark deities or our shark gods. Are we, we, these are um, Ohana, as we talked about, we're on the shores of Pu'uloa, commonly known as Pearl Harbor. Um, before the military occupation of our Pearl Harbor, we had very, very rich stories of our sharks who lived and 
protected the people of our area and we wanted to make sure that this is uplifted in this representative way to so show our Native Hawaiian students that we know that we are on the shores of, of Pu'uloa and that these are our stories that we need to be reclaiming and remembering. So in seeking a deeper understanding of the historical origins of inequities, um, in the summer of 2023, uh, the EDI, EDI committee approached uh, one of our political science professors, uh, Dr. Eiko Kusasa, and um, I, I know her from some other work I have on campus, and so I know that she had a deep uh, history knowledge about uh, settler colonialism, as it is in Hawaii, and so um, she suggested that we read her dissertation, which we did. And she was very open to meeting with us on a weekly basis because her dissertation was grounded in you know, theories, political theories and uh, power structures, and these are new to most of us. And so we were having uh, these really weekly discussions with her. And uh, let me just share that Eko is a settler descendant, and she studied under um, Dr. Haunani K. Trask, a renowned activist for Hawaiian sovereignty and a former professor of the Hawaiian Studies program at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. So there was a small group of us, just four of us, who were meeting on a regular basis with ACO. And through our discussions, we were able to develop a deeper understanding of the political context um, and history of Hawaii and including its implications on Native Hawaiians. And as a settler who was born and raised in Hawaii, I knew the history but then the underlying uh, you know, uh, reasons and power structures behind why Hawaii is what it is today you, you know, was relatively new to me. I was learning. This is kind of deep learning. And so we re really, uh, I really appreciated uh, having this, these discussions, these reflections, because oftentimes they got very um, personal as well, because we were breaking down some of the ideologies that we've been, uh, you know, that we've learned over many decades. And so th these conversations became, uh, you know, a lot about self-analysis on our ignorance of Hawaii's political history. And despite growing up in Hawaii, um, you know, it really impacted our worldview. And so recalibrating our worldview. So these are some things that, you know, we need to recognize, um, right? Hawaii is a colony of the American Empire, and again, most settlers in Hawaii are comfortable with their privilege to remain ignorant of the true history um, of settler colonialism. And so one of the major um, understandings around Hawaii um, is that Hawaii is a melting pot or a racial paradise, and it's a local culture, and in our local culture, it's a term used to describe what the multiculturalism is in Hawaii. Um, but what this narrative sort of leaves out is that Hawaii and Native Hawaiians are one of many cultures that exist in Hawaii as opposed to the host culture and the indigenous people of that land. And so it really takes away that ability for us to um, feel comfortable in our own land to be able to speak Hawaiian without receiving any kind of judgment or do any of our practices that really um, kind of are, are looked upon as being um, more multicultural, we are looked as more multicultural and that we are one of many, including Japanese culture and Chinese culture, which have very much assimilated into who we are today, but it really takes away from that understanding that we have a very rich culture that only lives in Hawaii and that it cannot be practiced anywhere else in the way that it is there. All right, so how can settlers support a Native Hawaiian place of learning? So as a settler descendant and OER advocate, right, I'm no longer comfortable with my privilege to remain uh, ignorant, or even worse to say that I'm a neutral bystander. Um, I need to do the work to understand the context in, in which I work and live, um, and uh, so that I do not contribute to the perpetuation of oppression and harm through my ignorance. In my uh, various positions and roles, um, I can, I can also be um, an educator to other settlers. Um, I acknowledge OER is a tool um, that can serve to um, help um, indigenize um, some of our curriculum, um, but, um, and, and that would give uh, indigenous people uh, more agency and on honors indigenous ways of knowing. 
So what should settlers do? Uh, we should listen. We should do our homework. We should give in addition to take, right? And we need to advocate for indigenous-led initiatives, not just as it pertains to OER, right? I think we need to be supportive of all uh, areas and uh, be allies to Native Hawaiian. Mm -hmm. Okay. So uh, doing the work, right? So what we're doing, uh, our EDI committee, is we're gonna organize a panel discussion on settler colonialism uh, in Hawaii for our campus. Uh, these are discussions that, as far as we're aware, aren't really happening in a public uh, venue. Uh, what we hope to do uh, post-panel um, is to facilitate a collective learning community, because our experience within our um, co EDI committee um, discussions over this past summer is that a lot of this learning can't be done in one day or by reading a book. We need to have deep conversations with one, on, one another, create safe spaces where people can be, you know, reflect and do the unlearning that needs to take place. And definitely, you know, for me personally, I want to ally with Native Hawaiians to support indigenization through OER, but also through other uh, means that, um, and when they need the support, you know, hopefully, um, you know, I'll, I can be there too help them. So how do we apply difficult knowledge to our work with OER? Um, and when we say difficult knowledge, we're using the, the uh, definition as laid out by Deborah Britzman, who says that difficult knowledge is the study of experiences and the traumatic residuals of genocide, ethnic hatred, aggression, and forms of state-sanctioned and hence legal social violence, as well as the study of any other's painful account encounter with victimization, aggression, and the desire to live on one's own terms. Essentially, things, events, histories, things that we cannot bear to know. And so how do we apply that to the work that we're doing? with OER. Um, as someone who's very, very new to the world of, of open education, I've done much of my learning within the past few months to develop this presentation, as well as here at OE Global over the past three days. Um, and it's allowed me to really better think through what the intersection could look like for us at Leeward with Native Hawaiian knowledge and scholarship and OER. A large component of this work is educating settlers as seen in the work that we are proposing to develop as a learning community around our political history of US imperialism and colonialism. And we ultimately know that it's a tool, OER is a tool, but not an end-all be-all. Um, one of the benefits of OER is that it can give faculty more agency in their work as seen in that example that we talked about with our Hawaiian studies professors. Um, it's just that we need to better know how to implement and utilize this tool of OER to sort of help them have the agency that they need to have within this Western structure that we're all working under. Um, and so what we plan to do and hope to do from here on out is to apply some of that gained experiential knowledge to future projects. Um, we want to assess our current Native Hawaiian knowledge within OERs, um, possibly partner with our friends here at VYUH and look at our other um, texts that are being developed across the system. Um, we want to develop a deeper understanding of current research from indigenous communities. People like Kayla are doing such important work within our indigenous OER community that we really need to ground into and better understand and develop a relationship with so that we can see how that looks within a Native Hawaiian context. And then what we ultimately want to do is see what are those protocols and best practices for working with a Native Hawaiian community um, with the faculty and knowledge and content. Um, I know I'm out of time, but I just want to end with a story. Um, Darian, um, at our keynote this morning, uh, Monday morning, talks a lot about how the Aina or the land is an open educational resource. And it really reminded me of the teaching that I learned in my halau or my hula school that I was trained under. Um, I was taught by Talpori Tangaro, who is a descendant, um, who is uh, trained and graduated from the school Halao Kekuhi, which is a really renowned hula school. And that was started by Auntie Edith Kanaka Ole on the big island in Keokaha. He would always remind us that when Auntie Edith would have class, she was an educator and a teacher, a uh, teacher of Hawaiian knowledge and hula. He would always remind us that she reminded her students that if anyone comes, whoever comes, you teach them. Everybody. You teach whoever comes. Um, which is a really powerful thing for me to remember as someone who was, sorry, 
raised away from my homeland, from my father's ability to pursue economic opportunities away from Hawaii. So I was able to benefit from that knowledge because of her staunchness in wanting to teach everyone. And I think that that can apply to OERs, but the other thing that Auntie Edith did was develop a halo, a learning community, a learning school that had staunch protocols and what we call kanawai, or laws. And we don't use laws in the same way that we do in the government, but guidelines, ways of behaving and acting when you receive this knowledge. You ask permission, you chant in before you enter that room. You, as you're learning, you have a set of behaviors that you adhere to as you're listening to your kumu talk. You listen, you don't talk. You watch and observe, and that is how you obtain your knowledge. And you don't share unless you've been given explicit permission to do so. I think there are huge lessons here in the way that this school, that it predates open and Western education systems for generations. I think there are lessons here that we need to take and we need to understand as we start to redefine what open means for our entire, our, our community and especially for our indigenous communities. So mahalo. Um, if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to contact us and we'll be here for a little while. Call for not leaving any room for questions. Mahalo. <laughs>